it's not only a powerful position, it's, it's a perverse system. In fact, it's the inverse of what we all as citizens should want. Nick Pennyman leads the group Issue One. Its new report, The Price of Power, exposes how members of Congress serve as cash cows for their party's political machinery. How much does a committee chairmanship cost? You've got to deliver 1.2 million uh, to the Republican National Congressional Committee. Democrats, it's about the same thing. It's almost like paying for the privilege of obtaining a certain position. It is borderline extortion. A Beatty grew up in a suburb of Manchester, a working class city where neighborhoods can be segregated and young unemployed men congregate, not unlike an area of Birmingham where we visited last year. I mean, in this area alone, this area at one point had the largest number of terrorist convictions in the country. But your whole goal is to stop them from getting to the point that they actually go overseas. Absolutely. President Trump promised a very hard line on China and its big trade surplus with the United States, 300 billion a year, at least 2 million American jobs. Since then, he's backed down. He swapped trade for North Korea when he didn't need to. Why do you say he didn't need to? China is going to do what it needs to do with regard to North Korea out of its own national security interests. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. Today, an exclusive first look at a new report that says you can put a price on success when it comes to Congress. The report by Issue One exposes the secretive money system in which members of Congress buy top spots on the most powerful committees. To raise the money, they often collect from the very interest their committees are supposed to oversee. Our cover story is the price of power. It's not only a powerful position, it's, it's a perverse system. In fact, it's the inverse of what we all as citizens should want. Nick Pennyman leads the group Issue One. Its new report, The Price of Power, exposes how members of Congress serve as cash cows for their party's political machinery. The best fundraisers are rewarded with powerful positions that decide the laws affecting all of us. Insiders report both parties have similar systems of dues that members have to pay every two years by raising money directly for the party, that's called dialing for dollars, and by giving some of their campaign funds to the party and to colleagues facing tough races. How much they raise determines who gets ahead. What we should want is that people rise in stature because of merit, not because of money. And right now it's money over merit. As an example, ordinary Republicans have six-figure party dues, but it takes more to make the ranks of leadership. How much does a committee chairmanship cost? So if you want to be the chairman of, uh, of a major committee in Congress uh, and you're a Republican, it, you've got to deliver $1.2 million uh, to the Republican National Congressional Committee. Democrats, it's about the same thing. It's almost like paying for the privilege of obtaining a certain position. It is borderline extortion. It's a far cry from bygone days. In the 1960s, a mere $100 donation could get you not only dinner with congressional candidate Shirley Temple, but also host Bing Crosby. Today, besides the $1.2 million required of A committee chairman, Republicans who chair secondary B committees are expected to raise $875,000 in dues. The top Republican in the House as Speaker has to raise $20 million. The number two majority leader, $10 million. Such details held tightly to the vest for years come from some of the 180 former public officials who belong to issue one's bipartisan Reformers Caucus and say they're sick of money's influence in politics. Former Congresswoman Connie Morella. I think we have reached a crisis proportions when it comes to money. A member of Congress devotes almost one third of every day to raising money. Former Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle. 
people leave on Thursday, they come back on Tuesday, they try to govern on Wednesday these days, and you can't run a country this complicated with the challenges we face and spend so little time doing so. Former Labor Secretary Bill Brock. If you tell me that the problem of money in politics, the distortions that it creates, uh, it's just going to keep getting worse. Shoot me. Shoot me. It's a flawed system, and it's like a nuclear arms race. The Democrats do more of it because the Republicans do more of it. Tennessee Republican Zach Womp co-chairs the Reformers Caucus. He was in Congress from 1995 to 2011. How are the members told how much money that they ought to raise? So the committees usually in the spring, and they just did this a month ago, they come out with a quota. And it basically says that if you're a chairman of a regular committee, it's X dollars. And if you're chairman of an A committee, an exclusive committee, it's even higher. So if there's enough money in your campaign account, you can just cut a check. Uh, or if you don't have enough money, you have to go over and what's called dialing for dollars. You sit in a little booth, they give you a list, you call people that you don't know who don't want you to call them, by the way, and you ask them for money. You tell them, we have this spring event coming up and maybe President Trump is going to be there and will you please dedicate ten dollars or $25,000 or $50,000 to this dinner and they keep a total of it and you see people advance to committee chairmanships and into leadership based on how much time they spend during the workday, taxpayer expense, making calls, shaking down the special interest. With all that pressure to raise money, sometimes these committee members are raising it from the interest they're supposed to regulate, true? Well, not only do they, they actually intentionally give you those lists of people that have something to do with your committees because they know that they're the ones that are most likely to say yes. Doesn't that pervert the system by which the members of these committees become beholden to the very people that they're supposed to regulate or oversee? Of course, yes. Necessary for household wealth to grow. For example, the House Financial Services Committee oversees matters involving everything from Wall Street and insurance to the stock exchanges. The big joke in Washington is that the Financial Services Committee is called the Cash Committee not because it deals with finances, but because just being on it allows you to raise so much money from bank lobbyists and bankers that it's like an ATM machine. The cash just pours in. On the heels of the mortgage crisis, as the Financial Services Committee considered new regulations on banking and real estate, money poured in from those industries. From 2009 to 2016, the Republican chairman of the committee, Jeb Henserling, raised $10.1 million, half of it from finance, insurance, and real estate interests. He transferred $8.6 million of it to the National Republican Campaign Committee and other House Republicans. The committee's lead Democrat, Maxine Waters, raised $3.7 million, one quarter of it from finance, insurance, and real estate donors. She transferred about $798,000 of that to the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee and other House Democrats. Henserling and Waters didn't respond to our request for comment. If there are members on the Financial Services Committee and they're having to raise that much money and they're taking it from the banks they regulate, who's going to have the leg up when it comes to the kinds of laws that they support? The kind of sad joke in Washington is you lean towards the green. And when you're on the Financial Services Committee, let's say, and most of your money or a big chunk of your money is coming from bank lobbyists that you're supposed to be regulating, unfortunately, you're probably going to lean more towards what they want. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee and National Republican Campaign Committee didn't respond to our repeated requests for interviews and comment. The system is so bad that the members hate it. Members of Congress hate to do it. The people they're calling hate to be called. What happens if they bucket, if someone says, I'm not going to raise this money? You won't advance, and they'll put their thumb down on you. They even ridicule you publicly at the meetings. This person is not making the calls. They're not raising the money. So while they might rather be taking care of the people's business, many spend countless hours catering to the interests that will help them pay their party dues. And I hate to use this word, but it makes prostitutes out of our elected officials. 
when the leadership says, if you want to advance, you have to demean yourself and go over there at taxpayer time and make phone calls to people that don't even want to talk to you, asking them for money for your party so that you can somehow advance the cause of good government. It really needs to change, and it's going to take the country because I can tell you they're not going to change it because they're stuck in this system and they're proliferating against each other, the two parties. Issue one says a simple solution that could be done immediately would be for the House to change its rules to say that fundraising cannot be taken into account when choosing committee members. No such plan is on the table. Ahead on full measure, British authorities are looking for terrorists within their cities. Scott Thuman visits one city that has seen the threat and is trying to do something about it. The Islamic terrorist attack this week in Manchester has raised the ongoing concern about terrorists living and plotting in our very midst. In Britain, France, Belgium, and in the United States, after each attack, the question is, when and how did the attackers become radicalized? Last year, Scott Thuman traveled to Birmingham, England, a working-class city similar to Manchester, where one man not only saw the terrorist threat, but decided to do something about it. I can confirm that the man suspected of carrying out last night's atrocity is 22-year-old Salman Abidi. Abidi grew up in a suburb of Manchester, a working-class city where neighborhoods can be segregated and young, unemployed men congregate, not unlike an area of Birmingham where we visited last year. It's where these young men are playing here. Is um, That's where I used to run uh, a soccer club. Follow Jahan Mahmood long enough and you are bound to find yourself in what over the years has been a breeding ground of aspiring terrorists. The population here is predominantly Muslim, uh, more than 80%. They tend to come from areas of Pakistan and Kashmir. On this day, he takes us through Birmingham, a couple of hours north of London, and where the former military history professor does most of his work, trying to de-radicalize young men. I mean, in this area alone, this area at one point had the largest number of terrorist convictions in the country. But your whole goal is to stop them from getting to the point that they actually go overseas. Absolutely. You feel you're being I mean, successful? That's what, uh, well, the people that I do know of who I've stopped is about seven. Like this 26-year-old who, to protect his identity, we're calling Cameron. When it all kicked off after September 11. And you wanted to get to the battlefield? I wanted to get to the battlefield. That was the main aim, you know. To fight back, I, I, to kill yeah, British, to, yeah, to kill Americans. Of course, yeah. If, that, if that's what it would have taken, yeah. That's what Jahan is trying to temper. He says in this area, where signs are often in Urdu and Arabic voices dominate the soccer fields, Roughly 40% of those living here are under 18. They are impressionable, easy targets for ISIS recruiters. He recalls one instance involving a handful of teens. He was watching, he had actually on his uh, phone, uh, the, he had downloaded the beheading of Ken Bigley, who was a British contractor in Iraq. And I was shocked to see these young men, a number of them huddled, huddled around watching and laughing. The Guardian newspaper claims 800 Britons left the country last summer alone to fight with the terror group. And just a week after our visit, four more alleged terrorists were arrested, two in this neighborhood. Who did you want to fight with? Um, it was obviously, you know, against the West, you know, because we felt like they were destroying, you know, people's lives. You were angry at America? Um, yeah, obviously, and also the UK at the time. Do you hear a I lot of that anti-American sentiment? I hear a lot. I mean, I have to be honest with you, is that we, I hear a lot of it, absolutely. And it's all based on uh, conflicts in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. To counter that, through meetings sometimes organized at a local mosque or at this old pool hall, Jahan shows them sobering graphic images of jihadists killed in battle, an example of what might come of them. And he points out that the terrorists often kill innocent Muslims. That was a bit of a turning point for you when you started to realize that yeah. Muslims were also being a target of the terrorists? Of the terrorists, yeah, definitely. It was, you know, it did make me think like, whoa, why would I go out there? It would be stupid of me to go out there. Jahan says winning over even one potential jihadist can have an incalculable effect. Yeah, I mean, one of the conversations I recall having is that um, 
Right, here's your car keys. Would you really hand them over to a local person? Would you really do that? And yet you're handing your life over to someone on the internet that you've never met before. Why would you do that for? But there's no perfect formula for de-radicalizing, and Jahan could use all the allies he can get. Imams, he says, are often falling short. I do feel that religious leaders have failed in their religious duty to try and make their community safer, and they've not been able to engage properly. It is gaining the upper hand, controlling the message that will be essential to turning the tide of radicalization in Britain, in Europe, and in the United States. The winds will be measured by individuals like Cameron. He's now 26 with a job, a wife, a child, and a future, one he was on the brink of gambling away. You look back now and you think that you would have just been a number. Yeah, definitely. I would, I, would have, I would have been a number and I would have been deleted at any time. And Cheryl, there is a parallel here. Uh, while investigators in Manchester have made multiple arrests by following leads to see who helped Abadi plot this concert attack, that's exactly what Jahan is doing in trying to prevent attacks. So he's finding out who's recruiting and influencing the young men he's counseling and then trying to de-radicalize them as well. So interesting. Thanks, Scott. Coming up next on Full Measure, President Trump's approach to China has changed since the hardline campaign rhetoric. We look at some reasons why. President Trump's America First promise in his campaign is coming in second to the geopolitics of the real world. Tough talk on trade with China hit a wall when it came up against the prospects of a nuclear armed aggressor. We recently spoke with Peter Morisi, who was chief economist at the U.S. International Trade Commission and is now a professor at the University of Maryland. What was President Trump's campaign stance on working with China and his vision of what we ought to do versus what you see happening now? Well, President Trump promised a very hard line on China and its big trade surplus with the United States, $300 billion a year, at least 2 million American jobs. Since then, he's backed down. What happened was he basically got focused on North Korea and he swapped trade for North Korea when he didn't need to. Why do you say he didn't need to? China is going to do what it needs to do with regard to North Korea out of its own national security interests. To the extent that North Korea is a threat, it will take what steps are necessary. Trump did enough by threatening to act unilaterally if other countries in the region did not assist him to get China to act. He didn't have to throw in trade as well. Because the last thing the Chinese want is the Americans going into North Korea, even if it's just bombing and so forth, because they're quite concerned about millions of North Koreans fleeing across the border into China. They want stability in the region. This would upset the equilibrium and so forth. Former Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson praised China for, quote, stepping up to keep globalization going forward. What do you think of that? I think Secretary Paulson is wrong. He's behaving like a typical New York investment banker and in that he sees his opportunities to make loans and finance the, the Silk Road and all the rest. The Silk Road refers to a plan China calls One Belt, One Road, the country's vast investment in shipping and transport to develop a trade route in markets reaching all the way from Malaysia to Europe. China seems to really be emerging as the global leader in many ways. Uh, there was a recent meeting attended by the Philippines, Russia, Turkey, Indonesia, Greece, Hungary, Chile, Argentina. Uh, many of them are getting billions in infrastructure investment from China. What does this say to you? Well, the Chinese have effectively used the money they've earned on trade to do two things. One is to build up the next level of industries. They're moving into what they call indigenous technologies. Namely, they're going after our high tech sector. They're not just going to assemble cell phones anymore. They're going to design the next generation of consumer products and sell them here. Then where is Microsoft? And they're turning it into a great foreign policy initiative. You know, Eurasia really does need a modernization of its east-west infrastructure, building better ports, air facilities, railroads, and so forth. And China's in position to finance that. This is the largest capital project since the Marshall Plan. Never before has one nation carried a greater responsibility for the fate of others in time of peace. The Marshall Plan was the U.S. initiative to help pay to rebuild Europe after World War II, named for Secretary of State George Marshall. 
If we were to go in the direction of America first, would that cause the United States to really lose global market opportunities and fall behind? If you're going to hardball people, bully smaller rivals and so forth, I think it really weakens American leadership. The only way you can fix the trouble spots in the world is if you have the support of your allies. What do you think changes because President Trump did not follow through on his promises the way he stated them? What sadly doesn't change is not a lot changes. We will continue to have a large trade deficit. When it comes down to it, Donald Trump didn't stand up to China. He let down those workers that voted for him. And I think he's going to be a one-term president because of it. And if he is, He's getting everything he deserves. This was his signature issue, and he really shouldn't have backed away from it. The president has taken at least one stand against China. U.S. warships have tested the Chinese claim to the islands in the South China Sea, sailing within 12 miles to show Beijing that they can't unilaterally claim ownership. Next on Full Measure, we follow the money to look at billions of your tax dollars being paid to illegal immigrants. In Follow the Money, the IRS is allowing huge sums of your tax dollars to be fraudulently paid to illegal immigrants, according to a new report. Federal law bars illegal immigrants from receiving public benefits, but the inspector general says the IRS is refusing to require people to have a Social Security number to collect the additional child tax credit. The IG says that gives an incentive for widespread fraud. In 2001, people without Social Security numbers collected $62 million in additional child tax credit refunds. In 2005, that number jumped to $924 million. In 2015, it reached $3.4 billion. At a recent hearing, IRS Commissioner John Koskinen told Congress the agency is cracking down on all kinds of fraud. The new requirement to hold earned income tax credit and child tax credit returns, and another change enacted by Congress to accelerate the filing date of Forms W-2, together have helped the IRS spot incorrect or fraudulent returns. This week, Chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, Senator Ron Johnson, sent a letter asking the Treasury Department to review the IRS's refusal to prevent fraudulent overpayments. Next week, an update on our investigation into a baffling illness responsible for nightmare scenarios. The disease mimics one of the world's most feared illnesses, polio. Millions of people have been infected with this EVD68, but a relatively few actually come down with the paralysis. Do we have any idea why those certain children get paralyzed? We don't know that yet, but it's worth noting that that phenomenon, that the same virus can infect thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of people with only a few individuals having catastrophic uh, events from the virus, is true for almost every virus in human biology. CDC gave the mysterious paralysis a new name, acute flaccid myelitis, or AFM, and more U.S. kids have been hurt seriously in the past few years than measles, Ebola, and Zika combined. That's next week. Until then, thanks for watching. We'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable.